to meet with uh, this talk here. Thank you also to everybody for uh, listening uh, to me. So let's uh, start. Uh, in case uh, you don't understand anything or you don't hear me clearly, please uh, tell me. So uh, let's go on. First, I will start with uh, recalling some uh, related results on the behavior of uh, harmonic functions in, in, in the boundary of domains. So um, suppose that uh, we have a, a Lipschitz uh, domain, uh, omega, so in, during all the talk, omega will be a Lipschitz domain in Rn. And uh, essentially, remember that this is just a domain whose boundary is uh, uh, given by uh, uh, pieces of uh, uh, pieces of uh, uh, rotated Lipschitz graphs. Okay, and uh, then oops, uh, one moment. Uh, then uh, uh, we have, uh, uh, a I suppose that we have a function u from the closure of omega uh, to r. Uh, I suppose that uh, this is C1 in the closure and harmonic in the interior of omega. And assume that u and its gradient uh, vanish simultaneously in a subset of the boundary with positive surface measure. By the way, we will denote surface measure by sigma during all the talk. So this is the n minus one dimensional half of measure in the boundary. So under this assumption of u and the gradient of u vanishing simultaneously, uh, in this subset of positive measure, is it true that u must be identically zero in omega? So um, uh, in the planar, so and there are some partial, some answers. In the planar case, this is known to be true. And this can be proven using uh, the fact that the logarithm of the modulus of the gradient is, a, is subharmonic. Uh, so that uh, then under these assumptions here, this logarithm is equal to minus infinity, right? In this subset. And uh, it is known that subharmonic functions uh, uh, can only be uh, to minus infinity uh, if, uh, and, uh, if um, in polar sets, unless uh, they are equal, identically equal to minus infinity. So, and then we get the result. Um, the answer to this uh, question, to this question, is also positive for general dimensions when u is a, a positive or a non-negative function. In this case, one can uh, use the fact that if u is not identically zero, then by a comparison principle of the boundary, for instance, uh, one can prove that the modulus of the outer normal derivative, so this is the outer normal derivative of u, uh, is bounded from below by the density of harmonic uh, function with respect to, sorry, for, by the density of harmonic measure with respect to surface measure, uh, times and constant. Uh, in this uh, set where the function is equal to zero in, in the boundary. So uh, since uh, harmonic measure uh, uh, is mutually absolutely continuous with respect to surface measure in its domains, it is, it, it, this is non-zero. Uh, uh, in, in uh, so this density cannot be zero in, in sets of positive surface measure, and uh, so we deduce then then the same happens for this uh, modulus of the normal derivative. Uh, the answer again is positive uh, in another uh, simple case, uh, that is uh, the case of general dimensions, and when we assume that u and the gradient of u are uh, both zero in an, some open subset of the boundary. Uh, and this can be proven, for instance, using uh, the fact that if we extend u by zero out of omega, then the Laplacian of u is equal to uh, some constant times the normal derivative of u times surface measure in that open subset of the boundary. So that uh, then, uh, we would, uh, we would get a function that is uh, harmonic across this open subset of the boundary and it, this function vanishes identically out of the domain and so it vanishes identically it, it, in, in some open set and so this uh, function, since it is harmonic, it must, be nice. uh, it must vanish uh, uh, in the whole uh, set omega. Well, it's a, a little exercise for you to, to write the details. Uh, here again, uh, we have the same question. 
So uh, again, we have this time shown you, that is C1 in the closure, and uh, you and uh, uh, the gradient um, vanish simultaneously in the uh, positive surface measure. And then, uh, well, uh, the answer to the, to the question that, if, that if, if you must vanish identically in omega, the answer is, is no. Uh, not uh, in general, the answer is no in, in general dimensions. And this was shown by uh, Burgen and Wolf in, in 1990. They proved, they showed that, that they, there are functions, U, uh, that go from the upper half uh, space to R, uh, that are harmonic in this upper half space, C1 in the closure, and uh, such that they vanish uh, simultaneously with, its, with their gradient in a subset of a positive surface measure of the boundary. And then these functions are, are, are not identically zero. So this result was later extended by Wang to arbitrary uh, C1 alpha domains. And in C1 alpha domains, he showed that there are uh, these type of functions also exist. And but the question is uh, still open if we ask, for instance, that they function U not only to be C1, but to be C2 or to be C infinity. So this, there are still uh, difficult questions here. So in view of, of the negative answer to the preceding question, then uh, Fang Hualin uh, studied a related problem with uh, somewhat uh, stronger assumptions. So, uh, and the problem is this one. So consider a, a Lipschitz domain omega again in Rn, and uh, suppose that u is uh, harmonic in the interior of omega, in, the, in omega and continuous in the closure. Suppose that u is uh, uh, now identically zero in some uh, a relatively open subset sigma of, of, of the boundary. So sigma is some uh, open subset of the boundary where u is equal to zero. And suppose also that the gradient vanishes in inside sigma in some sub, in, in, in a positive subset of sigma of positive surface measure. So not in the whole sigma, but in a subset of sigma of positive surface measure. Uh, let's remark that in this situation, uh, it is not difficult to, to prove that the gradient of u under these assumptions of continuity and, uh, and, uh, and that u is identically zero here in sigma, it is uh, one can check that the gradient of u is uh, defined as a um, uh, non-tangential limit, and it belongs uh, locally to 12.2 of sigma, and equal, it equals the normal derivative, right? Because yeah, the tangential derivative is is, uh, is a zero because u is constant in sigma. Okay, well, under under this assumption, uh, is it true that u is also uh, identically zero in omega? Well, uh, in this generality, the question is. Uh, uh, is open by now, but there are some uh, uh, interesting uh, partial results. For uh, the first uh, important uh, partial result was obtained by Fang uh, in this problem where he posed this problem. He showed that uh, uh, the answer is yes, so this is true uh, for C11 domains. Remember that a C11 domain is a uh, uh, Lipschitz domain such that the, the outer normal is uh, Lipschitz continuous. Uh, later in 1995, uh, Adolf Sonis, and Kenick proved that the answer is also positive uh, for convex domains. And uh, uh, again later, uh, in 1997 and 1998, Adolf Sonis, and Skowiatha and Kukavika and Nistrom, they proved that the answer is again positive for Dini domains. A Dini, a Dini domain is a Lipschitz domain whose outer normal is Dini continuous. If you don't remember the definition of Dini continuous, think uh, just if you want about C1 alpha domains. So C1 alpha domains in particular are, are um, Dini domains. C1 alpha is, remember that it means that uh, this is a Lipschitz domain such that the normal is, uh, is held there alpha continuous. All right. Uh, let me say also that uh, Fang Hualin and Adolfson Escaliaza, in fact, uh, obtained a stronger result than, than the fact that, that the gradient cannot vanish in a set of positive surface measure. In fact, they showed 
that the, that the gradient can vanish at, uh, at most in sigma in a subset of dimension n minus 2, which is stronger than, of course, than saying that the half of measure of dimension n minus 1 is equal to 0. All right. So, uh, so uh, and then this talk uh, deals with the, uh, this question of Van Qualin. So it's, uh, and the main result is uh, this result I, I obtained a few months ago, which essentially says that the, the answer is uh, positive if we uh, have a Lipschitz domain with uh, uh, a small constant. Or more precisely, let, uh, let us read uh, the, the result in detail. So we have omega Lipschitz domain in our n, a uh, ball b centered in the boundary, and we assume that sigma, that is uh, the intersection of B with the boundary, uh, is a Lipschitz graph with a small enough constant. The, this, the smallness just depends on the ambient dimension. Uh, then uh, if U is uh, harmonic in omega and continuous in the closure, and uh, then we assume also that U is equal to zero identically in sigma, and the gradient vanishes in a subset of sigma of positive surface measure, then under these assumptions, you must vanish identically in omega. Okay. Uh, uh, another couple of remarks first, that um, of course, as a consequence of, of this theorem, it follows that the uh, result is also true for C1 domains, because our C1 domain uh, is a Lipschitz domain and the local charts uh, can be taken so that the uh, Lipschitz graph has, uh, is as uh, small constant as, as, we, as we want, taking just the charts uh, small enough. Well, and this, the case of C1 domains uh, uh, was open up to now. Uh, let me say also that um, unlike in the case of uh, C1 alpha domains or Gini domains studied uh, previously, or C1 one domains, uh, from this theorem one cannot get, as far as I know, or from the methods of, 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 of to prove this theorem, uh, at least I cannot get uh, any uh, result about the dimension of the set uh, where the gradient of u uh, vanish uh, may vanish uh, when u is uh, non-zero. Apart from the trivial fact that this set uh, must have uh, at most a dimension n minus one, right? Because the, the uh, surface measure of this set is uh, equal to zero. Okay, so uh, before going to uh, the main ideas involved in, in the proof of the previous result, I would like to um, describe uh, a corollary regarding harmonic measure. It's a corollary that in fact I learned from Tatiana Toro. So, uh, and uh, this is uh, this one here. So uh, we have a Lipschitz domain as, uh, as in the theorem, a ball uh, be uh, like uh, in the theorem two centered in the boundary and sigma is uh, the intersection of b with the boundary of omega and we assume that this is a Lipschitz graph with a small enough constant so uh, then uh, suppose that we consider the harmonic measures of omega with different poles p and q and suppose that there exists some subset e contained in sigma with positive harmonic measure such that uh, uh, the harmonic measure restricted to E is the same when we consider the pole in P or the pole in Q, right? So they both measures, as, as measures, they coincide restricted to E. Then under, uh, in this case, uh, we have that the poles P and Q must coincide. And uh, uh, this is an easy uh, consequence of the previous theorem. Let us see why. But before that, let me insist on the fact that uh, this identity here is an identity of, of measures, which so that uh, this identity is the same as saying that uh, we have omega p of f is equal to omega q of f for all subsets f, right? For all sets. Okay, so uh, the way to get this corollary from the previous theorem is just by considering uh, uh, this function here. So we uh, define u as the green function uh, with polin p minus the green function with polin q, of course, of uh, the green function of, of the 
of, uh, of the domain omega. And, but we subtract two omega, two little balls around uh, P centered in P and Q. So that now uh, U is uh, harmonic in, 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 this, uh, uh, in this open set. Uh, the, uh, of course, this is uh, for epsilon is small enough. It is clear that this is a Lipschitz domain because P and Q are interior points of omega. And moreover, this function, because uh, vanishes identically in the whole uh, boundary of omega, because the green function is, uh, satisfies this property, each green function. And moreover, uh, taking into account that the uh, uh, density of harmonic measure with respect to surface measure is equal to the normal derivative of the green function with a sinus minus, because of this is an outer derivative, an outer normal, uh, then it uh, follows that uh, the uh, outer normal of U is equal to the uh, difference of uh, these two outer uh, norm, uh, sorry, outer uh, normal, normal derivative, sorry, normal derivative of U is equal to this subtraction of these two normal derivatives, which uh, uh, are equal in E. And uh, uh, because uh, omega and uh, uh, sigma are mutually absolutely continuous, because this is a Lipschitz domain, we have that the gradient of U uh, vanishes identically in E. So uh, then by the previous theorem, uh, since this function satisfies our, our, our the assumptions of the theorem, with sigma equal to the boundary of omega, uh, it turns out that U is identically zero in omega, or in omega minus these balls. But since this epsilon is as small as we want, it is uh, then immediate uh, to check that uh, the fact that this U is identically zero forces P and Q to be uh, the same point. All right. And now uh, the objective of um, the rest of the talk is to uh, give the main ideas of uh, the proof of the proof of, of the previous theorem, right? It is uh, this theorem here. All right. Uh, just a, a first uh, um, a general remark is that uh, most uh, properties or sorry most results about unit continuation of harmonic functions and also about uh, a unit continuation of solutions of uh, other PDs or like elliptic PDs usually they follow by studying their doubling properties. Then in, in our case, in order to study the doubling property of, of um, uh, our function U, it is useful to consider uh, this uh, notion here. So this function HXR. So this HXR is the integral in this sphere centered at X and radius R of U square. And we integrate with respect to the surface measure of the, of in this sphere. Uh, let's remark that this sphere uh, may be not contained in omega. So then we assume uh, always that U has been extended by zero out of omega, right? So that this uh, now this uh, integral makes sense for all radio, all points x and all radius r. Uh, notice also that um, if we extend a u by zero out of omega, then the function u will be continuous across this uh, set sigma, because the function u is continuous in the interior of omega or, or in the so in the closure of omega and vanishes identically in sigma, right? So u by the extension of zero is uh, continuous across sigma. All right. Then there is a, a theorem of uh, Adolfson and Scalia Fankenic, uh, which is this one here in their uh, work of convex uh, domains. And uh, they showed that if we have a Lipschitz domain and sigma is an open subset of the boundary, uh, we assume that U is harmonic in omega and continuous in the, in the closure. And uh, so we suppose again that U vanishes, vanishes identically in sigma. Suppose that u is not identically zero in omega. Then uh, we don't say for the moment anything about the gradient of u. Suppose that uh, we have this uh, kind of doubling condition so that hx2r divided by hxr is smaller than some constant, uniform constant c for all x in sigma and for all radius small enough. 
uh, you, should under, you should think about this condition as a doubling condition. Okay, well, under this kind of doubling condition, uh, then uh, it follows, one can prove, that the modulus of the normal derivative of u is locally an, in, an a infinity weight. And so, in particular, this uh, cannot vanish in a subset of positive surface measuring in sigma, right? Because uh, a infinity weights cannot vanish in in set of positive uh, measure. Let me insist again on the fact that this is a doubling condition, and and also uh, let me remark that in fact when we write this condition here, this condition here is equivalent to the analogous condition replacing um, these integrals in the spheres uh, by solid integrals in the ball. So the same, this condition is equivalent to saying that the uh, uh, quotient involving the analogous integrals in the solid, in the solid balls is uh, uh, also bounded. So which then perhaps is uh, uh, more clear why this is, uh, 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 this should be thought as a doubling condition. Uh, the, to prove this, that this equivalence is not difficult. One just has to use uh, subharmonicity. All right. So, uh, in a sense, uh, so uh, you have you should remember that some kind of doubling condition involving this avoids the vanishing of of uh, uh, the gradient of u. All right. Here again, we have our definition of H X R, and we have a pointwise version of the previous theorem. This is a version uh, due to due to and Scoviatha, uh, which is uh, quantitatively res less precise, but it's it's a pointwise version that is more flexible. So uh, we have again analogous domain sigma uh, uh, open in the boundary, uh, u harmonic in omega, continuous in the closure. We assume that u is zero in sigma, and uh, then u does not vanish identically in omega. Then uh, the theorem says that if we have a density point in sigma of the points where the normal derivative is equal to zero, then this limit is equal to, to infinite. So that uh, if, uh, this doubling condition, of, uh, the doubling condition involving HXR and HX2R fails as strongly as, as possible. And then, then this uh, that this limit is equal to infinite, then it forces you to have a, a zero of infinite order in X. Um, all right. Uh, uh, to see why this is a kind of uh, pointwise uh, version of the of the previous result, uh, just uh, observe that in particular, if this limit is bounded. So then uh, the theorem says that uh, X cannot be a density point of uh, these uh, sets where the normal derivative is equal to zero. So, or if you want, or more, if this is limit is all, always bounded, then there are no density points of where this is uh, uh, set. And so this set must have zero area. All right. So the previous two, uh, the previous two theorems uh, show that uh, the, the, the doubling conditions are strongly uh, connected, right, to the uh, continuity properties. Um, and now, uh, uh, just a couple of uh, a general uh, uh, fact that I would like to, to to explain for people that are not expert in in unique continuation problems. I, I think that I'm not an expert either, but. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, as, uh, as far as I know, there are two. One can say that uh, that, uh, that there are two main approaches to study the doubling properties of U. Uh, one is uh, by uh, Kahneman inequalities, and the other is uh, via the Almgren frequency function. Uh, Kahneman inequalities. Uh, uh, seem more flexible from the PD point of view, and they can be applied to uh, a great variety of PDs, not only elliptic PDs, but other kind of uh, PDs. Uh, and as far as I see, uh, the, on the other hand, the Algorithm frequency function 
of course, is, is uh, for elliptic uh, PDs, uh, um, uh, essentially, uh, but it seems more uh, appropriate for uh, uh, results involving geometric arguments. Um, by the way, as far as I know, the, the, the use of the argument frequency function in this context of uh, unit continuation was first uh, uh, considered by Garofalo, Garofalo and Lin. Uh, let me say also that uh, the, 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 the argument frequency function, the, uh, the precise or the study of the properties of the argument frequency function has been uh, uh, very important in, in in recent uh, uh, remarkable results by Chigger, Nebel, and Bartorta to obtain effective estimates of the size of singulars and critical sets of solution of elliptic PDs, and also uh, in, in, in the work of Lobonov, in recent work in, in uh, connection in, with the Nadi Rajvili and Yao conjectures. All right. So, and here uh, we have our uh, frequency function or, or Almagren frequency function. It's nxr, and it, it can be defined in this way. So this is equal to the radius r times the radial derivative, the derivative of respect to r, of the logarithm of the mean, this is a mean, of the mean of the integral of u square over the sphere um, with center x and radius r. And of course, uh, then rem this is, uh, remember that hxr is this integral here, but with without the mean, right? So if we have the mean, uh, then we, this uh, logarithm here is the logarithm of hxr divided by the surface measure of the ball. Perhaps this is not the most usual way of defining the frequency function, and perhaps is uh, uh, more typical to, to, to consider another definition. And the other definition is, is uh, this formula here that uh, uh, in, and one can get, uh, one can show that this uh, identity here is equal to this other uh, by integration by parts. In the case when we assume that this ball BXR uh, intersects the boundary uh, in sigma, right? So that uh, this intersection is fully contained in sigma. And remember that we don't assume these balls BXR to be uh, contained in omega, but uh, and, but the, but of course uh, uh, you should think that uh, they intersect omega. All right. So uh, this is another expression of of. Uh, mm, more, more well known of the frequency function, but uh, we will not uh, uh, use here in this talk. Although, of course, it's used in the theory. Uh, for people that are not uh, familiar with the frequency function, let me say that uh, one can think as the um, value of the frequency function uh, in, as uh, the some kind of local degree of the function u uh, or average degree, if you want, of the function u in the ball BXR. And one way to, to understand why this is the case is because um, if u is a harmonic uh, a, a homogeneous polynomial of degree d, then it is very easy to check that the frequency function uh, evaluated at zero and radius r is equal to 2d for all the radius r. And uh, this is very easy to check with this expression here because for this, uh, since u is, uh, we assume that u is uh, harmonic and uh, homogeneous, uh, well, then this average is uh, equal uh, to r to the power 2d, right? So if then if you have r to the power 2d, we take the logarithm, and then uh, this is uh, 2d times the logarithm of r, then we, when we differentiate, the radius cancels with the other r, and then we get 2d, so, right? So it's, uh, trivial calculation. All right. So uh, uh, in the same way uh, as polynomials uh, have, uh, when, when they have a uh, big degree, they grow faster and so the uh, doubling condition spoils. So you should understand that also the uh, 
this frequency function, it's normal that this will be related to the doubling properties of the function, right? A very important property of, uh, the function, of the frequency function is this one here that was uh, discovered by Almgren, as far as I know. In the case that the ball BXR is fully contained in omega, fully contained in omega, then uh, the derivative with respect to R is, is uh, non-negative, so that uh, the frequency function is, is increasing, non-decreasing in R. So that in particular, then we have that nxr is smaller than nxr0, that of course this is finite because we are have a finite function. If we, have, if we are in this situation, when we have two radius r and r0, and we assume that the biggest ball is contained in omega, right? So assume that we are for the moment in this, in this situation, then uh, remember that uh, we have this. This is the, uh, this identity here is just the definition of the frequency function. Remember that the frequency function is this derivative divide, multiplied by r. Of course, then uh, uh, with this inequality says that we have this here. And then if we integrate between r halves and r, then we have uh, well, that the logarithm of this quotient will be bounded uh, by the nx r0, that is, we should consider this as some constant, depending on x, of course, times log of 2. The 2 comes from this 2 here, right? All right, so this is an immediate calculation. And of course, this is equivalent to uh, saying that this quotient is uh, smaller than 2 uh, and uh, with this exponent, uh, with the exponent nx r0. Uh, but remember that this question here is, is, is essentially hx to r divided hxr. Well, it's, uh, I say essentially because uh, this question is this one if we don't consider the means, just the integrals. But since the, the surface measure of two, the two balls are comparable, we get this. So we get that this then uh, the limb soup. When we, uh, with the limb soup of hx to r divided by xxr, uh, tends, uh, when this, the radius tends to zero, this will be bounded, right? This will be smaller than some constant times uh, this number here. Okay, but this is the case uh, when we have, uh, uh, we have a, a, a some point x in the interior of omega, right? The problem is that, uh, remember that uh, the theorems of, um, Escoviaza, Adolson and Escoviaza, uh, for instance, uh, they ask uh, 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 to, they they ask to study or they involve this um, HXR or this this doubling uh, condition for points in the boundary, which and this is very deli much more delicate. Okay, so assume that uh, we are not now uh, we have a ball uh, that is not contained in omega. For instance, uh, this could be centered in the boundary, if you want. Not necessarily, but it could be centered. Well, in this situation, um, so uh, for instance, x could, should, could belong to sigma, let's say. Well, in this situation, uh, uh, some calculations that are a bit more complicated uh, show that the radial derivative of, of the um, frequency function is equal to some term that is non-negative, the same as before, plus this second term here. I don't write the first term because it's long and it's not, it's not relevant for this talk. So uh, the problem of the second term is that uh, it may be uh, positive or negative. It's not clear because it involves uh, the scalar product of y minus x and the normal, uh, the normal vector uh, the outer normal, the outer normal in the boundary. So this is the uh, this is the uh, outer normal in, in to the domain omega. Okay, and uh, y here belongs to this uh, uh, piece of the boundary of omega. Of course, then uh, this other uh, term, this modulus is positive. So then, to ensure that the radial derivative is positive, this is what we would like in order to apply an argument like the preceding one, it is natural to ask that this scalar product is non-negative for all the points y 
here, right, in the domain of integration. Otherwise, it's very difficult to, to argue, and uh, it's uh, like a zero-one law. If you get, uh, you have this condition, you get everything. If you don't get it, you don't cannot do anything. It is easy to check that this is equivalent to saying that uh, uh, BXR intersected with the closure of omega is a star shaped with respect to X. Let us see a couple of examples. So we have this condition that this is the, the one we would like to ensure that the rate of derivative of the frequency function is not negative. So suppose we have a, a convex domain omega. And I assume we have a point in the boundary, X, and we have this uh, a point Y here. Uh, and we have this ball, uh, what is uh, BXR. So uh, observe that this uh, piece of the domain is a star shaped with respect to X or if you want, the scalar product of this vector and this vector uh, is uh, positive, right? Uh, of course, we may we'll have uh, the opposite situation if we are uh, in some part of the bound that is uh, non-convex, right? For instance, like here. If imagine that we have this uh, part of the boundary in omega, so this is ellipsis domain, and now we have that, of course, this uh, piece of the domain is non star shaped with respect to x, and in fact, these two vectors, their product is negative. All right. By the way, uh, you can guess that uh, why convex domains are nice for these problems of unit continuation, right? Because of this property here. All right. So what to do uh, for general uh, domains, general Lipschitz domains? So, uh, so we have uh, uh, what we uh, can what we can do is something that was uh, uh, already. Uh, it's a, well, it's an idea that also was uh, that comes as far as I know from uh, Kukavik and Nistrom. So suppose that we have a Lipschitz domain omega, and suppose that uh, we have x in in uh, in omega, uh, so now we don't take x in, in the bound in sigma, but in omega, uh, and we have this ball bxr uh, uh, such so that uh, the intersection of the ball with delta omega is contained in sigma, and we assume that the slope is of sigma is rather small, smaller than some number theta, and uh, then the distance from x to sigma is bigger than some uh, absolute constant times theta times r. So this theta is the same here. Well, under these assumptions, it turns out that this product, uh, scalar product, is, uh, is not negative uh, for all points y here. So uh, graphically, I think it's, it's uh, easy to, 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 to see. If we have a Lipschitz boundary such as this one that is rather flat, if we are uh, we have a point x and this point is far from the boundary, then uh, this uh, domain, this intersection of the ball with the domain will be star shaped with respect to x. And also this scalar products will be, the, the scalar product of this and this will be positive. Uh, uh, this condition of star shapedness will fail if x is too close to sigma, right? For instance, if it comes here, or if we have a point Y that is uh, far from this ball, such as this one. Okay. So, uh, in a sense, uh, you should think that this condition holds uh, for points X that are not too close uh, to the boundary, right? Depending on the radius. All right. But so uh, we would like to show, remember, that. Uh, this limit is not infinite for almost all point in sigma because then by the result of um, of uh, Escauriaza, Adolfson and Escauriaza, uh, we get uh, that uh, uh, this point x cannot be a density point of the set where the uh, gradient vanishes. How to do this? Well, suppose we have a point x and I suppose that there is some sequence xk of points in omega such that xk minus x in modulus uh, that is comparable to this distance, suppose, suppose that this converges to zero. And suppose that nxk, uh, this frequency, uh, or I've evaluated at this point xk and we have some big number 100, for instance, multiplied by this modulus, that this is uniformly bounded for all 
points in this sequence. Then taking this radius rk, it is easy to check that we have this property. Remember that this, uh, uh, I said that this, the integrals involving h, uh, that are uh, integrals over spheres, behave essentially uh, as solid integrals. So it's then, since this ball is contained in this one, we have that this is smaller than this, and the analog will, analogously we have that this is smaller than this. So then we have that this quotient is smaller than this quotient. And now using here uh, uh, this property here and the arguments before, we have that this quotient is bounded by this A table uh, with this exponent here. All right, well, the eight would come because uh, uh, four divided one half is eight, right? And this, uh, we assume that this, and this is uh, uh, bounded by some constant because of this uh, property here that is also bounded by some constant. So we would get then that uh, uh, when we let rk tending to zero, this limit cannot be equal to infinite, right? It will be, we'll have some uh, limit of the radius rk that is. Uh, bounded. All right. Um, how so? How to implement this argument in our theorem? So uh, we consider uh, some another composition of uh, omega into Wigner cubes, for instance, uh, into this uh, this notation. So suppose we have some cube R, this Wigner cube, such that this its side length is comparable to the distance to the boundary. Then we have uh, two cubes that come here and others. So. Of course, this nice drawing will start to distort when we approach the boundary. But uh, let me say that the center of R is denoted by XR. And then we should think as uh, that these Winnie cubes have some kind of descendants, right? So that these are the first generation of descendants. This is the second generation. This would be the third one or the kth generation. So this WKR is the the k generation of descendants of R in this sense. All right. Uh, so the main, uh, remember that uh, we want to prove our theorem. So, and here there is the main, the main uh, technical result to prove the theorem. So uh, it says that if we have a Whitney cube, like the preceding one that we call R, and we denote by WKR, the family of Whitney cubes that are k level down from R as, as above, K level down, or 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 I, I say some K generation below, something like that, and we are supposed that this frequency function evaluated at XR with this with this radius that this is bounded from below by some absolute constant n zero, that is rather big, but if this is an absolute constant, then we take some a small constant delta, uh, very small, and then. Uh, the lemma says that if k, if, if we go uh, enough levels uh, 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 below enough, uh, then if k is big enough, then at least 10% of the cubes in this uh, generation, WKR, will uh, have uh, a big decrease in the frequency function evaluated at, the, at xq. So the frequency function eva evaluated at the points nxq, and you have to think about this as some fixed constant by now, delta minus two, but here we have, then this is smaller than one half, and then uh, we have the uh, frequency function of evaluated at xr with the corresponding radius with delta minus two times L of R. Right? So this is the side length of Q, and this is the side length of R, of course. Okay, so in 10% of the cubes, uh, let's say the, the frequency function decreases by one half. And then in the remaining 90%, we cannot ensure that the frequency function uh, does not increase, but what we have is that the, it does not increase too much. So that we have that this frequency is at most one uh, plus delta times this frequency function associated to the, to the cube R. All right. So uh, the, uh, what is important is that uh, this 10% uh, and 90% do not depend on delta. So we are free to choose delta as uh, small as we want. So the proof of uh, this uh, lemma follows by using 
uh, techniques uh, developed by Lowenov in connection with Nadirashvili conjecture, also using uh, it uses the monotonicity of the frequency function when x is close to sigma and some combinatorial arguments, and also a, a unique, uh, a quantitative unique uh, Cauchy continuation um, criterion. Then uh, the theorem is uh, proven using uh, this lemma in combination with the large law of, uh, sorry, with the law of large numbers. How do we apply the law of large numbers? So assume that we have a point x in sigma, then a point x in sigma can be identified with a sequence of Winnie cubes that approach uh, x, right? And with centered at, at points x, j. So if we have a sequence of Winnie cubes that approach the point x, so that the side length of these cubes is comparable to the distance. And uh, we uh, suppose that each cube qj uh, has side length uh, equal to two uh, minus kj. So, uh, Kj is, uh, let's say, uh, a k descendant of k of Qj minus one. So it's not its own, but it's the, the descendant of the of the k level. Okay, then uh, by applying uh, the previous theorem and uh, uh, identifying, in a sense, uh, points x in sigma with these sequences of, of, of Winnie cubes uh, approaching. Uh, points in the boundary, then uh, by the law of large numbers for almost all points in sigma, about eight, about 10% in 10% of this, of cubes in this sequence, uh, we have that uh, the frequency function uh, associated to this uh, point xj and with this side length, uh, this decreases by one half with the frequency function in the previous point xj minus one and with this radius here. And in the remaining 90% uh, of cubes in the sequence, the frequency does not increase. It is at most one plus delta times the previous uh, frequency, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a combination of, of, uh, of uh, the key lemma and, and the, the law of, of uh, frequency, sorry, of the law of, of large numbers. All right. Then, uh, of course, uh, it seems then that if delta is small enough, we'll get that uh, this limit will be zero, right? Because uh, one half uh, will win, right? Because although it appears this one half at only 10% of the times, this is delta can be taken as small as we wish. Uh, instead of um, deducing that this limit is equal to zero, the limit of this uh, frequency function is equal to zero, we get that this limit is, is finite. And the reason for that is that when we apply the key lemma, we have uh, this assumption here. So the key lemma cannot be applied always. Anyway, uh, if we have uh, get this condition, this is uh, enough to ensure that this limit, then when uh, there is 10 to zero of this hx 2r divided by x, xr, this is finite, right? Because uh, and by the previous arguments we had in the previous slides. Instead of, and uh, if this limit is finite, of course, the limit is not infinite. And remember that uh, Adolfson Escoriaza said, uh, if X is a density point of this set, then the limit should be infinite. So of course, this implies that X is not a density point of, uh, of, of, of the points of uh, where the gradient vanishes. And so the, the uh, uh, theorem is proven in this way. And very, very quickly, now I would like to uh, uh, mention a few open problems. First, uh, for instance, of course, it, uh, for what happens for general Lipschitz domains? We assume that the Lipschitz constant to be very large. I have tried and uh, uh, it seems really hard. I don't know. Uh, uh, also, for more general domains, cordial domains, for instance, uh, that are NTA domains with a regular boundary, if you want a snowflake type domains, what happens? This is even much more difficult. And uh, also, what happens with blow ups? Okay, so that's all. Thank you. <laughs>